Hey friends, welcome back to Torah Led Women. Thanks so much for stopping by tonight. Tonight is Shabbat Prep Day Radio. I don't know what number we're on. <laughs> 20 something. Um, tonight I am out on my back porch. Finally, it is cool enough. It's actually not all that cool out here. It is probably 85. <laughs> but it's not 95 and humid. So I decided to come out on the back porch tonight and give it a try. Um, I just b totally believe in fake it till you make it, so I'm going to pretend like it's fall until it really is fall. <laughs> so today um, I went out with my daughter. We did a lot of shopping and just some preparation. We have some company coming this weekend. I'm really excited. One of the lovely ladies who watches this channel um, has a child who has become long distance friends with one of my children. And so we are all going to be able to meet up this weekend and early this coming week. And so we have been bustling around the house to prepare to meet this family and just spend a few days getting to know each other. Uh, so Avalon and I went out shopping today. We went to the bookstore because, you know, Avalon has to go to the bookstore. In fact, everybody has to go to the bookstore when they go with mom because it's been so long since they've gone. But if I'm going every week with a different kid, <laughs> so I didn't find anything. But um, Avalon found a good stack of books. And we did that. We went to lunch at Chick-fil-A and we did our grocery shopping and it's just been a really good day. But I will tell you what, I'm so ready for Shabbat. It's only Thursday night, <laughs> but I am definitely ready for Shabbat. I am ready for a rest. I'm ready to get off my feet and just chill out and not have to do things. Uh, we have taken time off from school um, up until, I don't know, at least till after Sukkot, probably We'll get back from Mexico and then we'll take like the rest of that week off and then go back to school the next week. So we've got a good month-ish, a little more than a month off of school and I'm going to spend that time sewing and just doing some preparations uh, because at our Mexico we have a market day. And I am super excited about market day <laughs> because last year I made a bunch of head coverings and they sold like crazy. Those were such a blessing to the women there. And so I'm hoping to make up a bunch more um, because so many of the women were just really blessed to find someone to purchase those for at a, you know, relatively inexpensive price. And so I'm hoping to offer that to the women there. Um, I am also hoping to have one of my books ready uh, to put out for sale. I don't know. That might be a total pipe dream, but we'll see. Um, I'm going to give it my best shot. And then I have a couple of other ideas I'll show you guys as I get things made. But um, I'm going to spend the next few weeks doing that and visiting our company. I'm going to decorate for fall. I am just going to jump into this next season, um, and I'm super excited about that. So before I go into that topic a little bit more, I want to light our pink candle sculpted like a rose. Now are you guys familiar with the term huga? That is what we are going to talk about today. Um, so if you're not familiar, you will become soon. Come on, buddy. Light. There we go. All right, there's our candle. And we are going to talk about this idea of huga. It's a Danish term. Um, it means a few different things, but once we get going with this, you'll get a feel for what it means. So I want to talk about the difference between contentment and happiness because there is a difference. One big difference between contentment and happiness is their source. Your source of contentment, your source of happiness. You probably know where I'm going with this. So contentment can only come from the Father, right? He is the only one who can give us a true sense of well-being, a true sense of peace. We can only be content through our relationship with Yahweh. And I think that we can grow our contentment with Him by getting closer to Him, by understanding Him, and by being obedient to Him. The more at peace we feel with Him, the less um, uncomfortable we feel in His presence, the less we feel like 
maybe we need to hide and, uh, and you know, the less repenting we find ourselves doing day after day after day, where we're just kind of, you know, living a pretty decently righteous life the best we can. Um, I think the more content we will be because we just are walking daily with him in his peace and in his goodness, right? Not to say that we're never going to sin or, you know, we're never going to need to ask for forgiveness for anything. That is not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that when we can live daily where, you know, for the most part, we're not involved in things that break his heart, um, that can bring us true contentment. Contentment uh, can happen no matter what your life circumstances are. So you can be not necessarily the happiest person and still be content. Sometimes we really need to focus on being content even when we are not happy. If we don't try to focus on contentment, even in situations that make us unhappy, we will start to feel resentful. We will start to get mad at God. We will start to look over the fence at someone else's green grass and forget to water our own grass. We will miss the blessings that are in our own lives because we're too busy thinking about all the things that are ticking us off. When we are discontent, we become mad at the people that we love and we start to look outward at other people's lives and then we start to compare them with our own. And they're never going to match up, right? Because our idea of what someone else's life is, is not even close to what their life really is, right? Their Pinterest life, their Instagram life. We see these beautiful photos of these staged photos that are often sponsored by corporations. <laughs> And we think, oh, if I could only have that life. We become fixated on something that's just not even reality. So it's really important that we focus on being content, even if we don't feel happy. The thing about contentment is that it stays put even when life gets really rocky. And that's not to say that we're never going to have our peace rattled from time to time. Just that we will be able to find our rock when we are content in him. We're not going to be drifting and wandering. And we're going to know where our place of stability is even when peace gets rattled. Now, feelings of happiness, they come and go, right? They are based on emotion. They can be super flighty. Lots of things can make us feel happy. And some of those things can be of God. And some of those things cannot be of God. The ones that are from God can also help us to be more content. But I think that those things can change. The things that make me happy now are not the same things that made me happy even just a few years ago. I can look back on the things I used to like to do or I used to like to read or be entertained by or, you know, the ways that I would unwind and just, you know, things I enjoyed doing um, crafty wise or even just in the kitchen. Those things have changed. The things that make me happy are different now. I used to be obsessed with England and Jane Austen and traveling, and now, yes, it would be great to go back, but I'm kind of happy here, too. <laughs> I've got stuff to do that makes me happy right here in Northwest Arkansas. So we are coming into fall, and it is my favorite time of year. However, I'm also starting to feel already anxiety that it's just going to go by so fast that I'm going to miss it, and oh, my fall, it's already gone, and <laughs> it's not even September 1st yet. <laughs> When I get like this, it almost makes me not even want to get excited because what happens when I become disappointed? I don't want to put myself in that place of vulnerability. <laughs> now, I know this about myself, and so I am very careful to watch for it and to not sabotage my own happiness because it might turn out to not be exactly like I planned and expected, right? So I am learning <laughs> to be better about that. And I am hoping just to grasp this season and enjoy it for whatever it really is in my reality this year. Um, I just want to enjoy it. I just want to be happy, right? And already I'm sitting out here and I can hear, you know, the bugs buzzing and all that, but I can also hear walnuts and acorns falling out of my trees. <laughs> That is the first sign of fall for me here in my forest. So I am super happy and feeling super content. And I'm going to enjoy this season of autumn. So the idea of Huga. This is a little book that I got a while back. The Little Book of Huga, Danish Secrets to Happy Living. 
Now, we have to take this with a grain of salt, right? Because it's not um, scripture based, you know, pretty much at all. <laughs> but there is a lot of good stuff to be found in here as long as you understand that this book is about happiness, but not necessarily about contentment. So people have wondered, what is this word huga? How do you say it? Is it higgy? Are you getting higgy with it? It's huga, according to this author. Um, and he says, explaining exactly what it is, that's the tricky part. Huga has been called everything from the art of creating intimacy, coziness of the soul, and the absence of annoyance, to taking pleasure from the presence of soothing things, cozy togetherness, and my personal favorite, Cocoa by Candlelight. <laughs> so you're getting a feel already for what this huga thing is. It's just that cozy thing, right? It's a coziness. Huga is about an atmosphere and an experience rather than about things. It is about being with people we love, a feeling of home, a feeling that we are safe, that we are shielded from the world, and allow ourselves to let our guard down. You may be having an endless conversation about the small or big things in life, or just be comfortable in each other's silent company, or simply just be by yourself enjoying a cup of tea. Okay, so I really feel like this is super important uh, now. I think if we can find some of these sorts of things that just ground us, center us, and allow us to focus on the Father and the goodness that He has brought into our lives, uh, no matter how big or small that might be, that is really important that we do that right now. Because in case you haven't noticed, there's a lot of crazy going on in this world. <laughs> and people have asked me, why don't you make videos about what's going on in the world? Why don't you give your response? And I do very rarely do that. Um, and I could, you know, spend my days compiling a news report for you all, and I'd probably get a ton more views <laughs> if I were to, you know, be that sort of a news outlet, giving my point of view on what's going on in the world and blah, 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 blah. And I probably could do that, but I don't want to do that because that stresses me out and I don't want to stress you out. I'm not sticking my head in the sand, but I'm also realizing these things have to happen. It's biblically prophesied all over the place. <laughs> the stuff that is happening in our world right now is done for two reasons, at least two reasons. One, it is the Father's judgment. Okay? We were in a season of grace for a really long time, and I feel like now we are in a season of judgment, and this world is starting to feel His wrath. These things have to happen. A second reason that I feel like all of this stuff is going on is because it is setting the stage for biblical prophecies to be played out. Um, all of the mess with the economy, the mess with leaders, um, just, you know, things being destroyed, <laughs> um, people being oppressed, and regulations being, you know, talked about, rumored about, stricter and stricter, wars, plagues, all the things. This is a stage being set so that prophecy can be walked out. Now, we can't stop these things from happening. We can't. Um, but we can take care of our own sense of peace and well-being and stability and happiness, right? So I think that now more than ever, it is really important that we find some things that just bring us peace and joy and happiness. <laughs> and we can say, oh, I've got all that in the Father. And we do. But how do we practically walk those things out, right? Do I just sit around and bask in the glory of the Father all day long? If you can do that, awesome, wonderful, do it. But for me, I need to bask in that glory while I'm walking out some life things, right? While I'm making bread or while I'm coloring a picture with my daughter or, you know, putting together a craft or picking basil in my garden or whatever. Um, I want to be doing some things that bring me joy and happiness also. Okay, so that's what this little book is about. And I'm just going to read a couple of little pieces from it. And then we'll go into Pride and Prejudice. So there is this page here that says the Huga Manifesto. <laughs> so these are 10 things to help you bring some Huga into your life. Number one, atmosphere. Turn down the light. 
Number two, presence. Be here now. Turn off your phones. Now, I'm just going to say something there. For some people, being on their phone is something that brings them happiness. It is something that helps them wind down and be cozy. I'm not like an advocate for no video games, no TVs, no cell phones. Um, I'm just an advocate for using them wisely. Um, if it weren't for that kind of technology, you wouldn't be watching me and I wouldn't be talking to you and I wouldn't have a whole lot of the friends that I have right now. <laughs> I wouldn't have these friends coming this weekend to visit our family, right? So technology can be a blessing. Um, but when we are in the room with others, maybe we should put down our devices and look them in the eye now and then, I guess. <laughs> All right, number three, pleasure. Coffee, chocolate, cookies, cakes, candy. <laughs> okay. There is no moderation in this video. Think about moderation later. Right now we're just thinking about huga. Number four, equality. We over me share the tasks and the airtime. Okay, so if we all work together to get stuff done, that's what, you know, I tell my kids on Shabbat, let's all work together, or preparing for Shabbat anyway, right, on Fridays. Let's all work together. If we each take some jobs, we'll get it done real quick, and then our rest time can start earlier. <laughs> we'll all get to enjoy the benefits of the working together, you know, to get the tasks done. Number five, gratitude. Take it in. This might be as good as it gets. That's an interesting thought. <laughs> you don't hear that very much, right? This might be as good as it gets, and that's the truth. What you're doing right now, that might be as good as it gets. So enjoy it. Be content with what it is. Harmony. It's not a competition. We already like you. There's no need to brag about your achievements. <laughs> Seven. Comfort. Get comfy. Take a break. It's all about relaxation. And isn't that what our Sabbath rest is about, right? So thankful for that. Number eight, truce, no drama. Let's discuss politics another day. <laughs> Number nine, togetherness, build relationships and narratives. Do you remember the time that we, right? Remembering our special times together. Number 10, shelter. This is your tribe. This is a place of peace and security. So it may be um, a spouse, it may be a group of your children, it may be a group of your friends, and it may just be you. You and your cat are just you. <laughs> um, you don't necessarily have to have uh, people to share this peaceful and happy time with, right? Some of my best times are spent by myself. <laughs> All right, and then I move forward a little bit uh, to this section. Who get outside the home? Because I'm thinking about Sukkot. Sukkot is coming up. Feast of Tabernacles. Totally looking forward to that rest and relaxation time. You can huga by yourself, snuggling up under a blanket with your favorite TV show on a rainy Sunday afternoon is huga like Having a glass of red wine watching a thunderstorm is huga like too. Or simply just sitting by the window watching the world go by. But the most huga like moments seem to happen in the company of other people. A few years ago, my dad and his two brothers turned 200 years combined, so they rented a big summer cabin on the west coast of Denmark and invited the whole family. The cabin was surrounded by sand dunes and was set in a rough, rugged landscape where the wind always blows harshly. We spent a weekend there doing nothing but eating, drinking, talking, and walking on the beach. I think that was the most hoogalike weekend I spent all year. Whether you're sitting by a river in Sweden or in a vineyard in France or just in your garden or nearby park, being surrounded by nature enables you to bring your guard down and adds a certain simplicity. When we are close to nature, we are not engulfed in entertaining electronics or juggling a broad spectrum of options. There are no luxuries or extravagance, just good company and good conversation. Simple, slow, rustic elements are a fast track to Huga. One summer, I went camping with a group of friends along the Nissan River in Sweden. We were roasting chickens over the fire, and they were slowly turning nice and golden. In the fire, you could hear the sizzling of the baking potatoes wrapped in foil. We had paddled a fair distance in the canoes that day, and now darkness was falling. The fire lit up the trees surrounding our camp with warm colors, but despite the light from the fire, you could still see the stars through the treetops. As we waited for the golden chickens to be ready, we drank whiskey out of coffee mugs. We were silent, tired, and happy, 
and it was pure huga. <laughs> All right, and then this last section says huga on the cheap. So there's pictures for that one. <laughs> it says the best things in life are free. And there's another little fallish coat like drawings there. There's nothing fancy, expensive, or luxurious about a pair of ugly woolen huga socks, and that is a vital feature of the anatomy of huga. Champagne and oysters may be many things, but huga is not one of them. Huga is humble and slow. It is choosing rustic over new, simple over posh, and ambiance over excitement. In many ways, huga might be the Danish cousin to slow and simple living. It is wearing your pajamas and watching Lord of the Rings. It is sitting in your window watching the weather while sipping your favorite tea. And it's looking into the bonfire during the summer surrounded by your friends and family while your twist bread slowly bakes. Simplicity and modesty are central to Huga, but they are also considered virtues when it comes to Danish design and culture. Simplicity and functionality are the main ingredients of Danish design classics, and the Danes' love affair with modesty means that bragging about your accomplishments and flashing your Rolex are not only frowned upon and considered poor taste, but spoil the Huga. In short, the more bling, the less Huga. <laughs> Consequently, you can also play the Huga card as an exit strategy if you enter a high-end restaurant that you can't afford. Shouldn't we find a place that is more Huga-like is a perfectly valid reason to find a cheaper establishment. So this guy is a happiness researcher. Okay, this is what this guy looks like that writes this book. Can you kind of see? He looks happy. He has a scarf. He just looks like a happy dude. <laughs> so he's a happiness researcher, the CEO of the Happiness Research Institute in Copenhagen, in Denmark. He says, one of the most consistent patterns in happiness research is how little difference money makes. Of course, if you can't afford to eat, money is of the utmost importance. But if you're not battling poverty or struggling to make ends meet, an additional $100 per month is not going to move the needle when it comes to happiness. This fits well with Huga. You cannot buy the right atmosphere or a sense of togetherness. You cannot Huga if you are in a hurry or stressed out. And the art of creating intimacy cannot be bought by anything but time, interest, and engagement in the people around you. Huga can and often will be about eating or drinking, but the more it counteracts consumption, the more Huga-like it is. The more money and prestige is associated with something, the less Huga-like it becomes. The simpler and more primitive an activity is, the more huga like it is. Drinking tea is more huga like than drinking champagne. Playing board games is more huga like than playing computer games. And home cooked food and biscuits are more huga like than store bought ones. <laughs> but if you can't bake biscuits, just go buy some from the store. At least you have your biscuits. In short, if you want huga, there is no amount of money that you can spend which will increase the huga factor. At least not if you are buying anything more expensive than a candle. Huga is an atmosphere that is not only unimproved by spending more money on it, but rather, in some ways, the opposite. Huga may be bad for capitalism, but it may prove to be very good for your personal happiness. Huga is appreciating the simple pleasures in life and can be achieved with very little money. Here are 10 examples how the best Huga in life is free, or almost so. There's a little picture of a house there. I can't tell if these are blurry or not. You get the idea there. So for the sake of time, I won't read all the little things that he has written here um, to go into detail about these 10 things. I'll just read them off for you. So here's 10 inexpensive Huga activities. Number one, bring out the board games. Number two, pantry party. So cooking, right? Number three, TV night. Number four, croquet. Number five, set up a mini library. So he's talking about doing that either inside your home or outside your home, depending on how many guests you have coming through, I guess. But it's fun to exchange books, right? See what other people are reading. Number six, make a fire. Number seven, outdoor movies. Number eight, having a swap party. So bring things that you're done with and then everybody swaps. Number nine, going sledding, depending on where you live. 
Number 10 is just plain old play. Sports, hiking, partying, playing with children are some of the top things that he finds um, in his happiness studies that people enjoy doing for leisure. Playing children's games. So I hope that was kind of fun and inspiring. Um, we, of course, cannot do all those things all at once, right? But just picking out one or two um, new things that we might not have done before, especially if we are in a rut. Um, I have one child who his entire life has just made his own fun. This kid, on every birthday, he will like plan his own party, his own celebration, and then, you know, he gives us gifts and he makes a party for us. <laughs> or, you know, he works at a cookie shop um, and he decorates cookies for a living. Like, how fun is that? He's always finding a way just to love his life, just to enjoy his life. I remember as a little kid, he made this jar and uh, it was leading up to the new year. So each new year, he would write out goals for himself and things that he wanted to do. He'd make himself a little bucket list. Okay, this like five, six years old, okay? He's 19, yeah, just turned 19. Um, but when he was five or six years old even, he would make a little jar and he would put in all kinds of things that were like activities that he wanted to go and do. And then when he was bored or just needed something to do on a rainy day or whatever, a day at home, he would pull that out and do whatever was on that piece of paper. And it just kind of kept himself occupied. He made jars with happy sayings um, to himself or scriptures. And, and so when he was feeling down, he could pull one out and read it and cheer himself up. I asked him the other day, I was like, how are you always so happy? Like, how do you walk through your life just happy and content and cheerful? And he said, well, I just have a filter and I only let the happy things in. I mean, isn't that amazing? That's pretty sweet. So I'm just hoping that I gave you a few ideas for happiness and contentment. May we all strive to find both of those <laughs> in this new season. All right, friends, I'm going to start on our Pride and Prejudice reading if you want to stick around for that. Otherwise, I hope you have a beautiful Shabbat and I'll see you soon. For Pride and Prejudice, we are on chapter 19 of part two. Elizabeth has been spending some time with her family and seeing them through new eyes since Mr. Darcy gave his unsolicited opinion. And she's realizing, yeah, my family kind of is obnoxious. <laughs> uh, they kind of are. I can see why, you know, an outsider who doesn't already love them could really struggle with this family. Um, but I think the cool thing about Lizzie is she never actually dishonors them, right? She never gets on Darcy's side. It's like, yeah, my family, they're just a bunch of losers. <laughs> she still honors them. Um, and she is still kind, but she's starting to recognize what it is that uh, is kind of pushing people away, right? They all have our flaws. <laughs> Chapter 19. Had Elizabeth's opinion been all drawn from her own family, she could not have formed a very pleasing picture of conjugal felicity or domestic comfort. Her father, captivated by youth and beauty, and that appearance of good humor with which youth and beauty generally give, had married a woman whose weak understanding and illiberal mind had very early in their marriage put an end to all real affection for her. Respect, esteem, and confidence had vanished forever, and all his views of domestic happiness were overthrown. But Mr. Bennet was not of a disposition to seek comfort for the disappointment which his own imprudence had brought on in any of those pleasures which too often console the unfortunate for their folly or their vice. He was fond of the country and of books, and from these tastes had arisen his principal enjoyments. To his wife he was very little otherwise indebted than as her ignorance and folly had contributed to his amusement. This is not the sort of happiness which a man would in general wish to owe his wife, but where other powers of entertainment are wanting, the true philosopher will derive benefit from such as are given. Elizabeth, however, had never been blind to the impropriety of her father's behavior as a husband. She had always seen it with pain. But respecting his abilities and grateful for his affectionate treatment of herself, she endeavored to forget what she could not overlook and to banish from her thoughts that continual breach of conjugal obligation and decorum, which in exposing his wife to the contempt of her own children was so highly reprehensible. But she had never felt so strongly as now the disadvantages which must attend the children of so unsuitable a marriage, nor ever been so fully aware of the evils arising from so ill-judged a direction of talents, talents which, rightly used, might at least have preserved the respectability of his daughters, even if incapable of enlarging the mind of his wife. 
when Elizabeth had rejoiced over Wickham's departure, she found little other cause for satisfaction in the loss of the regiment. Their parties abroad were less varied than before, and at home she had a mother and a sister, whose constant repinings of the dullness of everything around them drew a real gloom over their domestic circle. And though Kitty might in time regain her natural degree of sense, since the disturbers of her brain were removed, her other sister, from whose disposition greater evil might be apprehended, was likely to be hardened in all her folly and assurance by a situation of such double danger as a watering place in a camp. Upon the whole, therefore, she found what has been sometimes found before, that an event to which she had looked forward with impatient desire did not, in taking place, bring all the satisfaction she had promised herself. It was consequently necessary to name some other period for the commencement of actual felicity, to have some other point on which her wishes and hopes might be fixed, and by again enjoying the pleasure of anticipation, console herself for the present, and prepare for another disappointment. Her tour to the lakes was now the object of her happiest thoughts. It was her best consolation for all the uncomfortable hours which the discontentedness of her mother and Kitty made inevitable, and could she have included Jane in the scheme, every part of it would have been perfect. But it is fortunate, thought she, that I have something to wish for. Were the whole arrangement complete, my disappointment would be certain. But here, by carrying with me one ceaseless source of regret in my sister's absence, I may reasonably hope to have all my expectations of pleasure realized. A scheme of which every part promises delight can never be successful, and general disappointment is only warded off by the defense of some little peculiar vexation. When Lydia went away, she promised to write very often and very minutely to her mother and Kitty, but her letters were always long expected and always very short. Those to her mother contained little else than that they were just returned from the library, where such and such officers had attended them, and where she had seen such beautiful ornaments as made her quite wild, that she had a new gown or a new parasol, which she would have described more fully, but was obliged to leave off in a violent hurry, as Mrs. Forrester called her, and they were going to the camp. And from her correspondence with her sister, there was still less to be learnt, for her letters to Kitty, though rather longer, were much too full of lines under the words to be made public. After the first fortnight or three weeks of her absence, health, good humor, and cheerfulness began to reappear at Longbourn. Everything wore a happier aspect. The families who had been in town for the winter came back again, and summer finery and summer engagements arose. Mrs. Bennet was restored to her usual querulous serenity, and by the middle of June Kitty was so much recovered as to be able to enter Meryton without tears, an event of such happy promise as to make Elizabeth hope that by the following Christmas she might have be so tolerably reasonable as not to mention an officer above once a day, unless by some cruel and malicious arrangement at the war office another regiment should be quartered in Meryton. The time fixed for the beginning of their northern tour was now fast approaching, and a fortnight only was wanting of it, when a letter arrived from Mrs. Gardiner, which at once delayed its commencement and curtailed its extent. Mr. Gardiner would be prevented by business from setting out till a fortnight later in July, and must be in London again within a month. And as that left too short a period for them to go so far, and see so much as they had proposed, or at least to see it with the leisure and comfort they had built on, they were obliged to give up the lakes, and substitute a more contracted tour, and according to the present plan were to go no farther northward than Derbyshire. In that county there was enough to be seen to occupy the chief of their three weeks, and to Mrs. Gardiner it had peculiarly strong attraction. The town where she had formerly passed some years of her life, and where they were now to spend a few days, was probably as great an object of her curiosity as all the celebrated beauties of Matlock, Chatsworth, Dovedale, or the Peak. Elizabeth was excessively disappointed. She had set her heart on seeing the lakes, and still thought there might have been time enough, but it was her business to be satisfied, and certainly her temper to be happy, and all was soon right again. With the mention of Derbyshire there were many ideas connected. It was impossible for her to see the word without thinking of Pemberley and its owner. But surely, said she, I may enter his county with impunity and rob it of a few petrified spars without his perceiving me. The period of expectation was now doubled. Four weeks were to pass away before her uncle and aunt's arrival. But they did pass away, and Mr. and Mrs. Gardiner with their four children did at length appear at Longbourn. The children, two girls of six and eight years old, and two younger boys were to be left under the particular care of their cousin Jane, who was the general favorite, and whose steady sense and sweetness of temper exactly adapted her for attending to them in every way, 
teaching them, playing with them, and loving them. The gardener stayed only one night at Longbourn, and set off the next morning with Elizabeth in pursuit of novelty and amusement. One enjoyment was certain, that of suitableness as companions, a suitableness which comprehended health and temper to bear inconveniences, cheerfulness to enhance every pleasure, and affection and intelligence which might supply it among themselves if there were disappointments abroad. It is not the object of this work to give a description of Derbyshire, nor any of the remarkable places through which their route thither lay, Oxford, Blenheim, Warwick, Kenilworth, Birmingham, etc., are sufficiently known. A small part of Derbyshire is all the present concern. To the little town of Lambton, the scene of Mrs. Gardiner's former residence, and where she had lately learned that some acquaintance still remained, they bent their steps, after having seen all the principal wonders of the country, and within five miles of Lambton, Elizabeth found from her aunt, that Pemberley was situated. It was not in their direct road, nor more than a mile or two out of it, in talking over their route the evening before, Mrs. Gardiner expressed an inclination to see the place again. Mr. Gardiner declared his willingness, and Elizabeth was applied to for her approbation. "'My love, should you not like to see a place of which you have heard so much?' said her aunt. "'A place, too, with which so many of your acquaintance are connected? Wickham passed all his youth there, you know.' Elizabeth was distressed. She felt that she had no business at Pemberley, and was obliged to assume a disinclination for seeing it. She must own that she was tired of great houses. After going over so many, she really had no pleasure in fine carpets or satin curtains. Mrs. Gardiner abused her stupidly. If it were merely a fine house richly furnished, said she, I should not care about it myself. But the grounds are delightful. They have some of the finest woods in the country. Elizabeth said no more, but her mind could not acquiesce. The possibility of meeting Mr. Darcy while viewing the place instantly occurred. It would be dreadful. She blushed at the very idea and thought it would be better to speak openly to her aunt than run such a risk. But against this there were objections, and she finally resolved that it could be the last resource if her private inquiries as to the absence of the family were unfavorably answered. Accordingly, when she retired at night, she asked the chambermaid whether Pemberley were not a very fine place, what was the name of its proprietor, and, with no little alarm, whether the family were down for the summer. A most welcome negative followed the last question, and her alarms being now removed, she was at leisure to feel a great deal of curiosity to see the house herself, and when the subject was revived the next morning, and she was again applied to, could readily answer, and with a proper air of indifference, that she had not really any dislike to the scheme. To Pemberley, therefore, they were to go. All right, so that is the end of part two. Jane Austen published this story in three parts. So she is getting ready for this adventure with Mr. and Mrs. Gardner. Um, a shorter visit than planned, not to the Lake District after all, but instead to Derbyshire, home of Mr. Darcy at Pemberley. And she is uh, very relieved to find that he will not be at home. And uh, they will be able to tour the home without actually running the risk of seeing him. So in this day and in present day, um, people would open their homes, the large estates would open up their homes for the public to come and walk around and, and you know, view the artwork and view the gardens. And a lot of times it was because these estate owners um, owned things that were, you know, valuable to the entire public, like artwork. And so it was a way of allowing people to come and experience that rather than, you know, hiding it away at this estate for just that family. But it was also a way of drawing in income for the family because a lot of times you could pay a fee. And that's kind of what's going on now. A lot of these estate owners in England are opening up to the public um, and charging a fee for tours so that you can see portions of the estate and gardens um, and they can have a little extra income to help keep their estates running, right? And a lot of times they will have a gift shop and a little book that talks about the history of the place that you're visiting. And um, so it's fun to go on a little, you know, estate tour. And sometimes they'll have tea shops or they'll have tea shops nearby and you can go and have lunch. And anyway, it's a thing, but that's what they're going to go do. They're going to go tour Pemberley um, House and Gardens. 
check it out. <laughs> All right, guys, I hope that this has been a blessing to you. Have a beautiful Shabbat, um, and I will see you soon. Do something hygge this weekend and tell me about it. Um, I didn't get any photos this week from people, but if you want to submit photos of things that you have done this week that have just been a fun, peaceful blessing for you, I'll be sure and put them up on our next Shabbat Prep Day radio. So have a beautiful weekend. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.